Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Chris Alden. I'm director of LSE Ideas. I, I'm uh, also here to invite you to join us for a, a talk uh, on bankrolling bigotry, uh, the disinformation business. Claire Melford, the co-founder and executive director of the Global Information Index, is, is uh, presenting uh, a uh, fascinating uh, talk on this particular subject. Before we, before I formally introduce her and, and the topic, I just want to uh, say that this is our digital IR project, the LSE Ideas Digital IR project, our launching event. So we're very pleased to have Claire part, as part of that in this particular topic as well. Myself, Kendrick Chan and Julia Ryan have all uh, together collectively put our heads together to, to start a project looking at how technology is impacting the world of international relations. So this is uh, one of the em emphases uh, that we have on uh, uh, that, that flows from that. We also look at digital statecraft, global connectivity and infrastructure and data and AI. Check our website out and you'll see more on that particular topic. So today's talk again is ba bankrolling bigotry and, and uh, the, the disinformation business. Claire Melford is the co-founder and executive director of the Global Disinformation Index, a nonprofit that aims to disrupt, defund, and downright disinformation. Claire is an experienced CEO in the commercial and not-for-profit not sector, founder of, of um, uh, of the um, International Business Leaders Forum, MD for MTV Networks, Nordics, and she's worked on startups and e-commerce, fintech and edtech, and was a founding member of Girls Not Brides, the Global Coalition uh, to End Child Marriage. Um, financial uh, uh, um, Bankrolling bigotry, of course, is going to examine how it is that, uh, that the internet an agent of one of the great, one of the world's greatest agents of, of free speech and democracy in the world, has both allowed self-expression on the part of individuals and communities to unprecedented levels, created new platforms for communities and capabilities, but at the same time, it's it's provided a, uh, an avenue for disruption of the very communities uh, that and uh, ideas of free speech that uh, we uh, uh, hold dear. So with that um, uh, start, I would like to hand it over to, to Claire and have her uh, take us through her work, her analysis and understanding of this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, welcome everybody who is listening. I will share my screen and give it a moment for it to arrive. Hope everyone can see that now. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. As Chris introduced, I'm the CEO or the Executive Director of the Global Disinformation Index. We are a non-profit. We're based in the UK, but we have about 30 people across eight or so countries to uh, defund disinformation. So I'm going to share today how GDI thinks about disinformation, how we assess it, and how our combination of human and artificial intelligence tools are already helping to defund it. But first, Let's just recap why this is so important. As Chris was alluding to, we really are at a watershed moment in the history of uh, information. The internet has uh, connected people and given a voice to people who previously were um, marginalized or disconnected. But those self same tools of social media, the ability to create content at will, and the ability to get that content monetized have caused uh, or created a situation where those same tools are being corrupted and exploited by those who seek to control and disrupt uh, our information ecosystem. And this is something that was predicted by Marshall McLuhan in the 1970s and labeled as fifth generation warfare. Network on network, using loosely affiliated groups of citizens um, mobilized by a decentralized attack on the integrity of the information uh, situation that they find themselves in. So this really is, the, the stakes could not be higher. But one of the first things we need to do is, is define disinformation. And there are as many definitions as, as there are types of disinformation in the first place. But our definition of disinformation at GDI is perhaps one of our most profound innovations. Simple definitions, 
such as we used to see in the in the last few years that are based on truth or falsehood don't pass the most basic Father Christmas or Santa Claus test. If disinformation was defined as simply lying on the internet, we'd all be clamoring, clamoring to remove mentions of Santa off Facebook, and yet we're not. But at the same time, the Breitbart News website used to have an infamous section called Immigrant Crime. You can, you can see it uh, on the slide here. And that section, technically every story in that section was true. It was a, a crime committed by someone who was an immigrant to the United States. But it's a poignant example of disinformation because it's an intentionally misleading narrative that immigrants commit crime at disproportionately high rates compared to native born Americans, which is statistically untrue. So it allows us to uh, get to a much more useful definition of disinformation. Cherry picked elements of the truth, potentially, uh, creating a, a misleading narrative. And those narratives are adversarial against, uh, could be a group, an at-risk group, people of, of color or different religions, uh, races, genders, um, people of different sexualities, or they could be adversarial against uh, institutions like the media or the police or the judiciary. Um, or the third category is narratives that are adversarial against science itself. And we see that a lot in disinformation around the COVID uh, vaccine or um, the coronavirus pandemic in, in general or 5G conspiracy theories um, or climate set ch change denial. So an adversarial narrative, which is the phrase uh, we use more than, than disinformation, is one that sets the read subject and the subject can be in any one of those three groups. And it leads us to a, a, a perhaps a more useful definition definition of disinformation, which is uh, uh, instantiated through these different narratives. It is it's not saying something is or is not dif disinformation, but it is saying content on this site or this particular article is content that is anti-immigrant, content that is anti-women, content that is anti-Semitic. And that becomes uh, a lot more useful when you're trying to disrupt the distribution, the funding of disinformation than a black and white label like it's disinformation, it's not. So we think of the th disinformation threat landscape in two dimensional plane with motivations varying from political or ideological, such as you might see with state actors, through to purely financial. And the actors who are behind the creation and the sharing of this disinformation vary from highly, influence, highly organized influence operators to grassroots trolls and uh, let's, let's call them politely business people just in it to make the money. And while there'll always be geopolitical information operators, the vast majority of the volume of online content is done for money. The attention-based business models that drive the modern internet create perverse incentives to create and disseminate disinformation because it's the emotive content, the content that triggers our negative emotions of fear, hate, greed, anger, disgust, that is much more engaging than more factually accurate or more neutral content. And when we click, we scroll, we comment, and hence we spend longer on the site or on the social media feed, and hence we are uh, available to be shown more ads. So one can summarize the disinformation business model as outrage equals clicks equals dollars. But how many dollars? How big a problem financially is this? How much money is going to these highly disinforming, polarizing, divisive sites that are uh, undermining our, our democracies? Well, the truth is that nobody knows. In 2019, we at GDI had an attempt at quantifying it, and we came up with this figure of about a quarter of a billion dollars. And we based it on, at that time, a very small uh, sec, about 20,000. And across those sites, at least this much money, this much advertising uh, revenue was ending up on those sites a year. And you can see on the slide, there were a range of different ad tech companies who were placing that money there, the, the intermediary between the, the publisher, uh, the owner of the website, and the advertiser who's advertising on that site. 
And you can see one company standing out um, above all others there, which is Google. And it's important to stress that we are looking, we can only see into what's called the open web. We cannot see into the closed uh, walled gardens of Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or Instagram. So we are only here looking at the open web. And the harms caused by this online disinformation are, are very real, both to people, but also to the advertisers who are funding this. And we've talked uh, about the obvious harms of racist violence triggered by uh, harmful narratives on sites like Breitbart about immigrants creating, committing crime, or the very obvious uh, emergencies that have been created by um, COVID disinformation over the last uh, 18 months. But it's also true that disinformation is brand unsafe. And last year, Omnicom, one of the large media agencies, found that over half of millennials and Gen Xers were influenced by where a brand's ad appeared, and that household brands appearing alongside harmful content being three to four times more unlikely to purchase from those brands. So to give you some examples of what this content looks like, here is a, a particularly lovely example from a, a site called DC Dirty Laundry. And the story is about how COVID isn't just, uh, isn't, isn't a pandemic, it, it's actually an extermination plan for, for the whole of humanity. And you can see that a travel brand, Agoda, is, um, has been caught uh, un, in, unavoidably next to this content and is therefore funding this sort of content. And you can see that we've identified the, the ad exchange there as being a company called Ad Supply. This next, next one is a, a, a sort of um, an interesting example which merges many narratives. So we see here uh, a site called American Greatness, which is one of the most pernicious purveyors of all sorts of disinformation, merging two different sorts here. The, the, the article is about how equity, which is code for um, racial e equality, and climate change um, are basically twin paths to socialism. And this has uh, been as the, the ad on this has been served by Amazon. Another example, uh, this is climate change denial on a site called World Net Daily. And you can see the, uh, this is trying to create the narrative that um, there, are, there, there is no emergency. There is no need to do anything uh, to solve climate change. And the brand here is Organifi. And one um, example just to show that this is not just an English language problem. In fact, the problem is probably more acute in other languages. Uh, this is a Spanish language site, Alerta Digital, talking about how a third of deaths in the United Kingdom from the Delta variant are amongst those people who are vaccinated, which is clearly untrue. And it's uh, Chipotle who has been caught uh, next to this ad unwittingly and uh, unfortunately for them has funded this highly dangerous disinformation about vaccines. Final example in German, I'm, I'm not even uh, going to translate that headline, I think it speaks for itself, but this is a political smear ahead of the German elections on the Green Party and really pernicious stuff and the supermarket brand Lidl will be horrified that they have ended up funding this sort of um, really uh, unpleasant disinformation content. Um, but it's not just advertising, advertising the only way that um, people who seek to pollute the information environment can make money. They can also make money from uh, e-commerce. It turns out that, uh, uh, sorry, it turns out that t-shirts and hats and other sorts of merchandise are also a very good way of monetizing your content. Um, so this is from, uh, and, and we see this happening across all of the e-commerce companies, Etsy, eBay, Amazon, are all provided to people monetizing QAnon conspiracies or COVID conspiracies or uh, anti-Semitic conspiracies about the, the global elite uh, secret cabal of people controlling the world. We did a study in uh, last year uh, ahead of the US election looking at the ways 70 hate groups in the US monetize themselves. And we found hundreds of different monetization strategies, not just the e-commerce. We found payment systems like PayPal and Stripe. We found um, uh, cryptocurrencies being used. 
And these were being used by groups such as those who were prime movers in the January the 6th insurrection at the US Capitol, uh, a group um, all of whom leadership have been indicted by the authorities are actually a charity in the US. So you can uh, get tax relief on your donations to your chosen military uh, militia extremist intent on insurrection. Now it's important to point out that since we published that report last year, some progress has been made and many of the companies listed here have taken uh, action to uh, prevent their services being used by some of these hate groups or have created terms of service that would um, prohibit it if they didn't already have so have, have them in place. So uh, the problem is big, the problem is broad, and there are many companies who are inadvertently or negligently allowing their services to be used to fund this harmful content. But what do we do about it? Well, there are a whole host of efforts out there to combat the problem, but we think it's really a, a whole of society problem and therefore it's gonna take a, a whole of society response uh, to solve this. And while things like fact checking have a very uh, important role to play, because a lot of disinformation as I hope I've shown is not just whether something is true or false, it uh, escapes from the, the limits of fact checking. Something can be factually accurate, but still extremely harmful. And also fact checking is largely done by people. Automated fact checking is, is not yet a reality. And the scale of harmful, toxic, divisive sites is such that uh, AI has got to be part of the problem. Many of the initiatives that uh, are tackling this problem are also commercially driven. And I think when you are assessing whether content is um, low risk or high risk of disinforming, it is challenging to have a commercial motive when you do that because it can create uh, conflicts of interest or perceived conflicts of interest. So I'll just take you through how GDI does it. One of the most important innovations here at GDI is that we use a combination of human assessment and large scale automation and machine learning to achieve both a high quality assessment of new sites on their risk of disinforming, but also scale. So traffic on the web is distributed uh, exponentially uh, with a small number of sites receiving outsized traffic and then a long tail of sites that can be just as influential when taken together. So for the high profile sites in any given media market, we employ human powered journalistic integrity reviews based on something called the Journalism Trust Initiative, which is an ISO standard for journalism, an international standards organization uh, standard for journalism. But for the long tail, we employ machine learning. So just quickly on the media, on the uh, human part, what we uh, do in the, in the human part of GDI's assessment is we look at uh, about 30 to 60 sites in any positive reports here from South Africa and the UK. And we work with partners in those markets uh, to assess the content from, from those 30 sites. And we do it in a way that is as anonymized as possible so that there can be as little um, a bias brought by the uh, researchers uh, to the de de determinations of risk uh, as possible. So what they'll be looking at is uh, text files that are completely stripped of any identifying markers so that they won't be influenced by the, the masthead or, or the, the presentation of uh, the content on the site. We do it uh, using, as I said, the, the Journalism Trust Initiative uh, criteria, and we look both at the operations of a site. How is a site, um, uh, how is a newsroom uh, organized? Do they have clear statement of editorial independence? Do they have a clear uh, corrections policy? Are they clear about who funds them? But also we look at the content of the site, and this is where we, it's really important to uh, strip out any of the identifying features to avoid or to, to reduce the chance of bias creeping in. We've done that across, uh, or by the end of this year, we'll have done it across about 19 countries. So that's how we do the, the human review of the largest sites uh, that get the most traffic on the internet. For everything else, we use uh, AI. And we actually instantiate our definition of disinformation, this adversarial narrative uh, topics within the technology. 
So each adversarial narrative is given its own machine learning classifier, which then allows us to search for content that matches that narrative at scale. So you'll see on the uh, top right of this some colorful bars. Each, this, these are screenshots from our internal um, uh, dashboards of our, of our technology stack. The, the colorful bars, each of them represent a different narrative. So you can see uh, misogyny, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, anti-Black content, climate change denial, et cetera. And the height of the bars shows how often that particular classifier has been triggered that day. And the chart on the bottom, the blue lines, is uh, just the, the volume of content that's been crawled, that's being crawled by our, our uh, crawlers at that moment. So we have uh, about half a million domains that we crawl every day. Uh, we look at um, hundreds of millions of pieces of content. We have 20 different uh, adversarial narrative topic classifiers that we look for content in, and it works in a, a range of languages. So far, it's available in six uh, European languages, and next year is all about branching out into, into more uh, complicated uh, languages in, in Asia. So this combination of uh, human review for the top 30 sites in a country and the machine learning platform has allowed us to assess and to give risk ratings to over 500,000 news sites from around the world in multiple languages. What we then do with that data is we provide it to the advertising technology companies who are the ones placing the ads on the websites on behalf of advertisers. So if you think back to earlier uh, in the presentation, I was identifying different technology companies like Google or Ad Supply or Rubicon, who were the uh, the tech company placing the ads by giving this data or making this data available to them they are then able to allow advertisers a choice about whether their ads end up when we first made this data available uh, about 12 months ago we've had a, a new company signing up pretty much each month which does demonstrate that advertisers are beginning to care significantly about where their ads end up and about where their, what sort of narratives and what sort of harm their advertising dollars may inadvertently be creating. They are demanding higher standards of brand protection from the ad tech companies they use. They will no longer tolerate their brands being next to these rising our societies, undermining our democracies, eroding our trust in the scientific process and hampering our ability to deal with the existential crisis of climate change. So in summary, while cutting the funding to disinformation won't eliminate all of it, it certainly won't eliminate, stop people creating it for political or ideological reasons. It's certainly a really important step along that road. Thank you. Delighted to take questions. Great, thank you very much. Really fascinating. I I, um, I wanted to, to ask you a, a question that came out of your present directly out of your uh, presentation. Um, if you can do all of this in in terms of assessing uh, 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 adverse con adverse content and the like, uh, why why can't Facebook uh, do this more readily? Well, where is the you know why, where are there gaps or do I misunderstand uh, something here? <laughs> No, that's a great question. Um, there's nothing that uh, there's nothing technically that we do that uh, a, a as a small thirty person nonprofit uh, that a company the size of Facebook or Google couldn't do technically. But there are two uh, really important factors to consider. One is their incentive to do it. The the highly polarizing content that fills a, a significant portion of um, Facebook's news feeds is very engaging and therefore while people are staying on their Facebook or their Instagram uh, newsfeed they are um, ready and available to be shown ads. So there is a real conflict of interest particularly for companies like Facebook to reduce the engagingness of their content. This, even if that were not true I don't think we want to live in a society where decisions about which content we get to see, which content is returned top of our search page in our, in our search engine, or which content is put at the top of our newsfeed, are made by a very tiny number of uh, white men in Silicon Valley. 
we certainly don't want those decisions made by government either. So I think we need to evolve towards a new model where uh, uh, the middle layer, the civil society organizations play a key role in providing assessments of content online, which the technology companies can use as part of the signals that they uh, use to determine their ranking decisions. The situation we're in now is that those, all of those decisions are in fact made by people within the commercially, gen commercially driven, unelected uh, company, um, companies like Facebook and Google. And we really need to avoid lurching to a, 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 the opposite extreme where these decisions are made by government through inept regulation, but rather move towards a, a middle way where companies have to take third party data about the quality or the riskiness of content into account. But it is third party assessments, not government assessments and not Facebook or Google's assessments. Thank you. I, there, I see a question from Joy, who's a researcher at a geopolitical consultancy, and it, it touches on some of the things we just spoke of, but I'll, I'll ask her question directly to you. Um, this is, is this a problem with the business model of online advertising in general? What is the root cause of the problem and what can be done about it instead of fact-checking fact later? Yeah, so uh, absolutely, it is a business model problem. It's not, uh, it clearly some disinformation is ideological. The, the Russian state or the Chinese state or the Iranian state will, uh, or, or any government, frankly, will continue to put out uh, messages that they view as favorable to them. But the, from, a, from the technology company's point of view, the way they get, uh, the, way, the way they monetize themselves is through advertising. And from anyone who is a content creator's point of view, the primary way to monetize yourself is through advertising. And in a world where there are no barriers to entry, no barriers to creating content, if you want your content to be viewed, if you want your content to get attention, you've got to make it engaging. And the way to make it engaging is to tap into our negative emotions. So while we are existing in a world of unlimited content creation that is funded by advertising, we will always be moving more towards more polarizing, more de divisive, more extreme content, because that is what engages us. That's what keeps us clicking, scrolling, sharing, commenting. That is what will drive the ad dollars or the, uh, the sales of T-shirts and food supplements and so on. So yes, it's a, whether the content is created for ideological or financial reasons, the business model and the fact that engaging content gets revenue is going to continue to drive this increase that we all feel in unpleasant content online. And what is required is a combination, I think, this whole of society response that I was talking about, which is a combination of regulations to uh, enforce some types of um, third party assessment of content into the way uh, technology companies uh, rank and monetize content, coupled with um, greater media literacy uh, and more critical discernment of, um, of us as consumers, um, coupled with a much richer civil society response which goes beyond uh, fact-checking, which has a role, but it is limited by both scale and definitional issues because much of the most harmful content is not factually incorrect at all. You can, you can uh, create a polarizing and uh, deceptive narrative just by asking questions. You don't even have to include any fact that could be checked. You can just wonder, muse, uh, muse on your blog about whether climate change would really be that bad or wouldn't the extra, extra carbon dioxide actually stimulate plant growth you can that can't be really fact-checked but it's still a very damaging narrative uh, particularly so if, if major influential people are, are making those sort of uh, musings with numbers of followers and that sort of thing um, I, I wonder what's the difference between this and, and I mean you've said the drivers for this media are ultimately advertising 
but uh, surely our old, as, as a uh, resident older person, I remember reading newspapers and things like that. And of course, advertising is, is the backbone of, of these uh, uh, forms of media as well. Why, why, are they, why have they been different or, or how, why has society responded differently to that, for, that relationship between advertising and information uh, as opposed to the, um, uh, the, the type on social media? Um, sorry, was your question uh, what what is different about print to social media? I'm just wondering how we print could presumably in print we can have a range is equally broad range and pr presumably the core incentive selling papers right was was always at play as well in the print media. But what why is it that they is it regulation that changed how, uh, the relationship between the scandalous you know, uh, broadsheet to the to the the more centralized uh, narratives that come out of contemporary uh, uh, print media. I'm just curious if you know they, they went through this process. Uh, yeah. are, are we essentially going through that process as well in the social media venue? Something we did in the eight, 19th and perhaps early 20th century with print media. Yeah, no, really interesting question. So I think a couple of things are different. Um, in Before the internet and particularly before um, social media, information was, the way we, we got our information was governed by gatekeepers. So you had an editor of a, of a newspaper or a magazine and there were editorial standards and it was uh, expensive to run one of those. You had to have staff, you had to have printing presses, you had to pay for paper and then distribution to physical outlets. So there were great barriers to entry, great barriers to creating and distributing information, which is one of the you know, wonderful things of the internet. It has democratized access to information, but it has also democratized uh, the creation of uh, information. So you know, you, you can, uh, and people do, publish what look like newspapers with perhaps sort of reassuring local town, um, you know, the San Diego Chronicle or something. They sound very much like bona fide newspapers, but in fact, they are content farms that are spreading particular political narratives and they are replicated across 30 or 40 different um, cities in the US or it happens in other countries as well. They look like what we used to know of as um, uh, print publications with the same editorial standards, but in fact, there are no standards. There are no uh, barriers to creating that content. So that's the first thing is that the gatekeepers to information went away. The second big trend that has happened over the last 10 years in particular is that when I used to work in television and, and in the early days of the internet, Advertisers used to buy placement and now they buy people. So advertisers used to buy placement on a particular publisher outlet or a particular television channel or, or a particular newspaper. With the rise particularly of um, social media, but also the what's called the programmatic online advertising system, the, there, there's been huge wholesale harvesting of our personal data, which has allowed um, people to build up incredibly detailed uh, pictures of us, our buying habits, what we're thinking about through what we type into Google, what we share on our social media feeds, what we're buying through what we buy off the Amazon or eBay platform. And that's created an ability to target us as individuals. So advertisers no longer buy uh, a, a slot on CNN's website. They buy a specific individual and they can find that individual no matter where they are on the web. On the web. If they were to advertise to them when they're on CNN, they might have to pay $2 to advertise on that website. But if they follow that self same individual that they've already identified is the sort of individual they want to sell their product to, if they follow that individual to a really cheap gambling site or uh, I don't know, some cheaper site, they might only have to pay 20 cents to advertise to that same individual. So it's made it uh, that there's a, a per, there's a perverse incentive for some advertisers to get 
their ads in front of people in much, much cheaper ad, uh, environments than they would have done normally. So although advertisers are, and that's one of the reasons why advertising has flooded these very low uh, quality sites is because it's so cheap for an advertiser to get to reach people there. What we're seeing now is as the damage caused by this, these very toxic, polarizing, divisive, dangerous, sometimes dangerous sites, there is a backlash against that, which is now leading advertisers to, to demand much higher standards. Thank you. No, that, that helps understand that very much. Here's a question from Peter. Do authoritarian countries like China and Russia have a part in exacerbating the issue, or is the issue largely a profit-driven one? It, it's, it's both. It's absolutely both. So there's uh, a lot of um, a lot of examples of uh, you know Russia, Russia pretty much I think they even gave us the word disinformation and and have been masters at uh, what's called information operations for 70 odd years now and and disinformation has been around for as long as people have been speaking to each other but the the Russians certainly um, have a very advanced playbook of how they um, try to um, uh, if I can use the Steve Bannon phrase, flood the field with shit, they will pump out multiple different conflicting narratives in response to the poisoning of the Skripals uh, in the UK or the downing of MH17, uh, not because they expect anyone to believe one specific story that's pumped out on one uh, Kremlin aligned network versus another, but because the aim is to confuse and uh, uh, wear people down so they no longer know what to believe and so they do not trust anybody. So from the point of view of um, a state actor like Russia, the aim is to undermine people's confidence and trust in uh, dem particularly democratic, democratic government and democratically elected societies and, and institutions. That content is also very engaging and more, more engaging than perhaps a sort of um, detailed Bellingcat inquiry into what actually happened to MH17 and therefore it will get more people to click on it. Therefore it is also useful to those people who want to earn money for it. So you can't, you can't really separate the politically motivated, the ideologically motivated from the um, financially motivated. And in many places, they are the same thing, because what those in power are trying to achieve is maintenance of the status quo. So undermining uh, the will and the confidence uh, of their citizenry in changing the status quo is ultimately the success that they're trying to uh, get to. Thank you. We have uh, another question, just a short one, I, guess, I think, is, is do you have any plans and in, of expanding into Eastern Europe by Sasso Vinovsky. We've certainly done uh, several of our um, human powered media market reviews in Eastern Europe. Uh, we've done ones in Georgia um, and we will be doing Ukraine later, uh, I think early next year actually. So we, we have done a, a, a range of countries um, and the, the point I will make is while that gives us really interesting added data on which sites within a country are low risk and therefore um, good places for advertisers to place their money versus high risk, they should definitely avoid placing their ads there. Ultimately, the plumbing of the internet, the, the, the technology layer on which all of these sites are served on, on, and uh, through which all of us access these sites is the same. And it is largely American companies who provide us access to these sites, whether we're looking at them on uh, Google or Facebook or Twitter or Amazon or many of the smaller platforms too are all American companies. And the, the, the level below that that provide a lot of the ad tech services and the, and the website hosting are also American companies. So while uh, a geographic focus can be really useful from the narrative perspective to understand what, what is the latest narrative that is going to be uh, weaponized, the solution is often, uh, is really to target those people who are the plumbing of the internet and they are often American companies. And, and you said something about other languages uh, 
at, at the very beginning of your remarks. So other languages ha were, were even more, more than English, I assume, were even more uh, prone to this. Is that, uh, can, you, can you elaborate upon that particular point? Sure. So the internet is um, largely English language. About 50% of all the umpteen billion websites on the internet are thought to be in English, with Spanish the second most uh, prevalent language that appears on websites. And of course, not all of the sites on the internet carry advertising. But um, there, there are, there are what we see particularly coming out of the, the, the Facebook files that have been um, much in the news in the last month is that the version of Facebook, for example, that we see in, um, in the US is actually the best version of Facebook there is. They have plenty of moderators. They invest hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, curating the news feed of English language speakers largely based in, in the US. They don't even understand many of the languages which uh, are, are used on their platform in other parts of the world. They don't even have content moderators who speak those languages. They have no AI tools trained in those languages. So what happened a few years ago in uh, Myanmar with the persecution of the Rohingya Muslim uh, community is just one of an increasingly uh, prevalent um, trend of unchecked, highly, polarizing, divisive, and deeply dangerous content that is rife on, on Facebook. Um, so while the advertising tends to flow to the majority language on the internet, to the, to the English language, there is a, a, a huge problem with Span Spanish language disinformation, particularly targeted at Spanish speakers in the US. And when you get to the smaller languages, it may be less about um, financial motivation, but there is uh, even less um, focus and attention paid to it by the, by the platform. So it's, uh, it's an increasingly concerning problem. Thanks. And we have another question from Kendrick. How can one spot fake news or disinformation given the proliferation of, quote, news, unquote, nowadays? Is there any golden rule of thumb? As an as a individual, well, this is much more into media literacy, which is not my area of expertise, um, but I think th those who are expert in media literacy would always suggest you check your sources uh, and also ask who benefits. Um, if, if, a, if you're reading something and it's from, uh, and you can't see a source, you can't see what the masthead of the publication was, there isn't a byline, so there isn't a, uh, a named author, uh, you haven't seen it on any uh, more mainstream sites uh, and it's referring to something and you can see that maybe somebody would benefit from you believing this, then those are all good um, tips to suggest you should at least do some further research and you certainly shouldn't share it uh, or engage with it in any way unless you are really sure that it is um, quality, comp quality information. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that that, uh, that gives us some good guidelines. Um, here's another question. I th it says um, this is uh, from Shinchiro Okuda, who's a student here at uh, LSE. Um, I think it's basically a great initiative to use the business model of advertising to eliminate the page value of biased information. However, I have one question. If opponents with extreme views on issues such as vaccines and climate change or nations such as Russia and China hit back at you saying that such initiatives are biased, how would you respond? That's a, a great question. Uh, you can never, um, firstly, we deal with a biased question by uh, not dealing with it. We are not uh, saying certain content should be taken down we are not saying certain voices don't have a right to exist on the internet. All we are doing at GDI is saying, yes, you have a right to free speech. And in many countries that is protected by law, but in no countries do you have a right to profit from that speech. That is never protected by anyone's law. And conversely, advertisers have a right to choose where their adverts end up. So, Yes, uh, Russia can and does sometimes uh, say that organizations like GDI are 
you know, outlets of the Secret Service or something, fine. Uh, but it, ultimately, we are about uh, disrupting the funding of disinformation. And the way we have tried to make that possible is not by assessing whether a piece of content is, is biased or not. This, uh, the bias is not the problem. The, the problem comes from whether there is a real risk of harm caused by the adversarial nature of the narrative. So is it, a, it, is, is it setting one group against the other? And is there a risk that that um, adversarial relationship could lead to real world harm? And if you can do that, then you can sort of sidestep the bias conversation. So can you, I know you gave us at the beginning, but uh, two, two sentences, which would, one would be seen as non adversarial and one would form and another as adversarial. Um, so yeah, so, I'll, uh, so if, you, if you think back to the Breitbart immigrant crime section, what made that an adversarial narrative was not the reporting of the crimes committed by immigrants. So if, if, if they had been reported just as news, that wouldn't be adversarial. What made it adversarial is the framing of it in its own section called immigrant crime because what that is doing is creating a, a, a false narrative that immigrants commit crimes at a higher rate than native born Americans, which actually isn't true. So it is the framing of that particular piece of content, not the veracity of it, that is adversarial. And that's why things like fact checking are very useful, but have their limits. No fact checker would pull Breitbart up on the veracity uh, they were all correct through repeated exposure that is deeply adversarial and the other point I'll, I'll make is that disinformation is is not an event it's a process we don't become radicalized into certain points of view by a single piece of content but the repeated exposure to narratives like immigrants commit crimes at a higher rate than native born Americans over time creates uh, a, a really divisive um, culture which can lead to real world harms and I think if January the 6th did anything positive it was to show that incites people to take extraordinary um, illegal and highly damaging actions in the real world. Okay and then um, uh, Julia has a question. What role do state interests play in propagating, propagating disinformation? If misleading narratives benefit governments, how can non-state actors push back against this? Yeah, that's very hard. Um, that's really hard. I think all, uh, all, all we can do is um, the sorts of things that are being attempted ac uh, across the whole of the disinformation space. So um, more assessing of content by independent bodies, more raising of awareness of um, the funding of disinformation and more focus on media literacy across the spectrum. So that while all, all the factors that will help us reduce um, commercially motivated disinformation are not going to make a difference to politically motivated stuff. That really is about creating a, a, an, um, a, a citizenry which is much more media literate than we have now. And there are countries that have done a very good job of this. Finland, for example, has been at the forefront of a deluge of uh, information operations from Russia for 30 odd years and has had media literacy on the education syllabus, I think, from primary school. For, for all of that time. And they consistently um, win those surveys of being able to spot um, harmful content online versus citizens from other countries. So it's not an easy answer, but I think it is, it is such a whole of society problem, um, disinformation, that it is going to require a whole of society solution, which I know is uh, a bit of a non-answer, but it's particularly the political stuff is, is extremely hard to tackle. 
we have a, a, a similar question or question uh, that, that echoes something early asked earlier, but um, from uh, Aaron, a uh, high school student from Basel, Switzerland. How far are we to creating AI capable of fact checking and filtering out targeted misinformation? So we're going beyond the, the informed citizenry as such and having AI solutions. Um, I'm not an expert in fact checking. Um, I, I know that uh, automated fact checking is really, really hard. It relies on uh, having an enormous database of previously fact checked content and then comparing what you have seen, what the computer is seeing versus that um, database. Uh, and, and that's just really hard to deploy at scale. So if, if I reframe the question, uh, as how much will AI help us in general in this um, challenge? Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely part of the solution, but so is human review. So I, I, it's going to be a combination of uh, multiple tools that are going to reduce this, but we mustn't, um, re regulation is gonna have to be a part of this also, because with, this, with the business model as it is today, there is very little incentive for companies to do the right thing and a lot of incentive for them to drag their feet until they're, until they're made to. One additional point I'll, I'll tack on in case um, uh, this was what was in the questioner's mind is that I often get asked, how worried should we be about deep fakes and uh, the ability of uh, sort of widespread ability of people to manipulate video content to look like um, you know, I'm a um, spokesperson for Al-Qaeda or something. Um, and while those demonstration uh, pieces that we've all seen are, are deeply worrying, uh, you can actually mislead uh, an entire, you know, million, tens of millions of people in the US were misled into thinking that the US election was stolen by people just repeating the election was stolen over and over and over again. So you, you actually don't need advanced technology to convince very, very large numbers of people of things that are either not true or, or harmful. You just need to aggressively uh, weaponize the systems that are out there now. So I hope that's slightly comforting that uh, I don't think we need to be that worried about deep fakes yet. Yes, yet <laughs> is the operational word. <laughs> um, a question from Jose Osuna. Um, have you used your approach to disinformation and adversarial discourses in the context of politics? It would be very interesting for scholars in the area of populism and radicalism to be able to classify and detect some of the content you study. Um, if that's a, um, I'm not quite sure what the question is getting at there. Uh, we certainly make our data available to researchers. So if there are researchers out there who study things like uh, radicalization, um, we're always open to um, doing data sharing arrangements with uh, research organizations. There is a big overlap between radicalization and, and disinformation. Um, I said earlier that disinformation is not an event, it is a process. And that process of um, radicalization, whether it be to um, a, p a particular religious extremism or uh, the, the radicalization of people like the Christchurch massacre shooter, they all happen um, through a, a process that we think of as a, a funnel, a radicalization funnel. You can think of it a bit like the marketing funnel that many people will be familiar with. People start off uh, looking at content that is perhaps maybe just a little bit questioning of whether the current government approach to lockdowns is uh, appro is the best or something. And the, the way algorithms in, in so social media particularly work, it will lead them to more extreme versions of that content. So relatively quickly, no matter what you uh, go onto YouTube or uh, Instagram looking for, within uh, a matter of um, days or weeks, you will be looking at the most extreme version of that content online. So I often sort of joke, if you, if you go looking for a muffin recipe, you'll end up within a few clicks or a few scrolls looking at extreme veganism um, or uh, anorexia content. So there is a real radicalization process 
that is inherent in this uh, engagement based business model of these companies and and that is that is why i think we're seeing an increasing number of people adopting these very radical views which are far outside the mainstream one one last thought Do, does um liability matter in terms of to people pursuing these sites or the individuals curating these sites would that would uh, stronger regulatory regimes involve that kind of response so so giving them a financial cost or perhaps even tagging that to the advertisers themselves who choose to put, put their ads on those sites yeah i mean there's a huge school of thought about um in the us it's, it's known as section 230 reform to to reform the um carve out of liability that the internet companies have from content carried on their systems. Um, I, I think that is, um, I think that's, prob that's problematic. There, there may well be, I think if you try to regulate content, that gets you very quickly into some uncomfortable areas of government regulating speech, which is perhaps not where we want to be. And uh, ultimately, what, what people say is not the problem. It is wh whether what they say is amplified and put in front of millions and millions of people. So it's actually the amplification algorithms that are the cause of the harm rather than the content itself. If I can stand on a soapbox in speaker's corner and shout whatever I want, but if I have an audience of three men and a dog, it world harm from that so potentially regulating the algorithms rather than the content um, and making companies liable for what they amplify might be a route but there are legal scholars who will tell you that that will also have just as much of a chilling effect on free speech so these these are very live conversations being played out at the moment so it seems we're in the in the middle of the of really figuring our way out of this this uh, dark uh, many rabbit holes that we've found ourselves falling down. Well, thank you very much, Claire. It's been a, a, a really engaging and, and absolutely crucial uh, discussion that that we've had today, and and the work that you're doing is is part of I know is part of the answer here. So we're looking to you and, and others like yourself to to guide us in this regard. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all our listeners and, and uh, the questioners as well. And again, um, it's uh, those of you who are interested in pursuing further LSE IDEA events in the digital IR sphere, please do check uh, our website. We have a lot of content emerging with this new project there. Great. On that note, thank you for joining us and uh, see, you very, uh, see you all very soon. Thank you, Claire, once again. Thank you.